Hi everyone, thanks for joining. We're gonna get started now. We have Dr. Moore here, Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health, so I'll turn things over to him to get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Ontario continues to make great progress with its vaccination efforts, including the last mile strategy to offer COVID-19 vaccine to those who are unvaccinated or partially vaccinated. Over 81% of the eligible population have had their first dose and under 400,000 doses are needed for us to reach our target of 75% fully vaccinated. This is an incredible accomplishment and thank you to all Ontarians. But we must do more in the face of the Delta variant. For the last several weeks, I have been unwavering in my pleas for all eligible Ontarians to step up, roll up their sleeves and get vaccinated. I said time was of the essence but now that time is here. We must take assertive action to protect the health of, and safety of all Ontarians, especially as we move closer to a return to school and the cooler weather drives us indoors. The policies I am announcing today are an important link in the chain of protection that will help keep Ontario strong in the face of the fourth wave. The Delta variant is more transmissible and has resulted in a reintroduction of COVID-19 in some high-risk settings, such as hospitals, home and community care, and congregate settings. These are settings where individuals are at a higher risk due to age or their health conditions or comorbidities, and we need to better protect them. That is why I am issuing a directive to require COVID-19 immunization policies in hospitals, home and community service providers, and ambulance services. Effective September 7th, the directive will require covered organizations to implement policies that require their employees and others in these sectors to either provide a proof of full vaccination against COVID-19, provide a documented medical reason for not being vaccinated, in addition, covered organizations will be required to offer an educational session about the benefits and risks of COVID-19 vaccination. In cases where individuals do not provide full proof of vaccination, they will be required to undergo regular testing and demonstrate continued negative results. This directive outlines the minimal standard that is expected should an organization choose to implement policies that go above and beyond, they will have the authority to do so. But policies for these sectors is not enough. That is why we are intending to proceed with vaccination policies in other sectors, including congregate care settings, such as residential and community services for adults, and community-based service providers for children with special needs. And as the return to school approaches, vaccination policies in our educational sector will be crucial as we look to minimize the impact that COVID-19 could have on our children, youth, and young adults. In support of the province's robust return to school plan, the Ministry of Education is finalizing a vaccination policy for all publicly funded school board employees as well as staff in licensed childcare settings with rapid test requirements for staff who are not immunized against COVID-19. The government also intends to proceed with requiring vaccination policies in post-secondary institutions and in retirement homes. This builds on the great work of many institutions such as Seneca College, Ottawa, Western, Queen's and Toronto University who have already implemented immunization policies. More information will be made available to all of these sectors in the coming days and weeks. Another important step is that province will offer a third dose of COVID-19 vaccines to most vulnerable Ontarians. Specifically, this includes those that are transplant recipients individuals receiving treatment with an anti-CD20 agent, patients with hematological or blood cancers who are on active treatment, 
and a third dose can provide an improved immune response for these individuals. But it's very focused and narrow in the eligibility criteria. The province will also be offering third doses to residents of high-risk congregate settings, including long-term care homes, high-risk retirement homes, and First Nations elder care lodges. And starting tomorrow, all children turning 12 years of age before the end of 2021 will be eligible to receive their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine and can book their appointment through the provincial booking system or through their local public health agency or can walk into vaccination clinics across the province. Finally, we are pausing our exit from the roadmap to reopen. We need to get the vaccination policies in place and our vaccination rates up. I know what has been outlined for you today is a lot to process, but this is what we need to do to protect Ontarians. We are continuing to follow the data and the evidence and keeping a low rate of infection in our communities and building community immunity will protect our most vulnerable and keep our schools, our businesses, our social settings as safe as possible and minimizing further disruption. I want to take this opportunity to thank Minister Elliott and Premier Ford for their ongoing leadership and support as we continue to protect everyone in Ontario from COVID-19 and the variants. We need to be proactive to avoid the reactive closures that result in significant impacts and are on our mental, physical, social and economic well-being. Every shot in arms is our best shot out of this. We can do this, Ontario. I'm happy to take any questions. We'll go to the phone lines. Just a reminder, one question, one follow-up. Over to the first question, please. Your first question comes from Randy Rath with CHCH-TV. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Doctor. This, this question is probably best posed to one of the ministers of the Premier, but they seem unwilling to talk to me today. Why did this take so long? Uh, you know, school starts in three weeks. It takes six weeks minimum to become fully vaccinated. Um, surely you've known that for, since... For a long time, why? Why now? Why hasn't this happened before? Uh, thank you, Randy, for your question. So we've been monitoring the evidence, uh, and we've been um, monitoring our immunization rates. Um, we had a sudden drop off over the last several weeks, uh, and quite honestly, we have to rebolster our efforts to immunize uh, Ontarians. Um, it was unexpected to have such a sudden drop off, uh, and we've learned more about the threat of Delta. It is now. Over 90% of the detected samples are of the Delta class uh, or variant uh, in Ontario, and we're now seeing our rates of illness go up. Uh, and we're seeing our hospitalization numbers go up. Um, as a result, uh, we are now making these uh, recommendations on immunization policy. I still believe there's significant time for this to have its desired effect, that Ontarians continue to embrace immunization as our ticket of safety uh, over the next coming months, where Delta is going to try to rear its head and spread rapidly. Uh, we just have to look around uh, in other provinces, in the southern United States, states where Delta is really taking hold. Uh, I think this government's taken a cautious approach. Uh, we're step, staying in step three. We're uh, now embracing immunization policies. Uh, I think you can recall that several weeks ago I did uh, say the clock is ticking 42 days before uh, school was supposed to start uh, and uh, uh, clearly called on Ontarians to come forward. We're making progress. It's just not quick enough and I think these immunization policies will better protect Ontarians uh, against uh, the fall uh, and are heading in the right direction. Um, uh, and um, if you have another question to follow up, I'm, I'm happy to try to answer. Follow up? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, when you talk about um, regular testing for the unvaccinated to go into their workplace, what does that, what do you mean by regular testing and how much do these tests cost and will the onus be on the unvaccinated to pay for the test? 
Uh, good question. So there'll be no cost for the test. Uh, most of the funding for these antigen or rapid tests are from the federal government. Uh, we have ample supply. Um, these uh, uh, these are being distributed to our partners as we speak, uh, and the instructions on how to use them uh, are being detailed. Um, so there's no cost to the uh, patient, uh, the client, the end user, uh, and the federal government at present is paying the cost for their implementation uh, in Ontario. The confirmatory test, if it's positive, would be a responsibility of Ontario and would be a PCR test. Um, the frequency of the testing will be uh, following the risk in the community in which the individual lives or works. Uh, and uh, at a minimum, it would be once a week. It would escalate uh, to up to twice or three times a week, depending on how Delta is spreading in the community. Uh, uh, my preference is that any individual embrace immunization as the strategy to best protect themselves, uh, their community, uh, and those that can't be immunized, especially children under uh, 12 years of age uh, and those that are older who are still um, uh, vulnerable due to their immune status. Immunization is the best decision to make, uh, but if despite you make that uh, decision not to be immunized, we need an alternative such as testing, and the testing frequency will be at a minimum of once a week and escalate based on community risk. Next question. Your next question comes from Alex here with Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Hi, Doctor. Uh, just want to follow up on that previous question. Um, just want to know how frequent uh, how frequent testing can be done, especially if we escalate up to two, three times a week without having unvaccinated people miss school or work. Yeah. So the the rapid test can be done uh, at a. a the time of entry, or it can be done in advance. Uh, it, it is rapid, so the turnover and results can be within 20 minutes. Um, uh, and and um, we are working on methods to um, ensure that that can be done rapidly at entry points. Um, the testing strategy uh, is one component of a multi-component strategy. Clearly, uh, we hope that individuals embrace immunization as the preferred choice, um, but we needed a backup if they didn't. Uh, and the rapid antigen testing um, is accessible, available, timely, uh, and um, we have enough equipment to be able to distribute all across Ontario as needed. Follow-up. Thanks. And I'll follow up. Uh, just wondering if we have any data on the percentages of hospital workers and education workers um, and how many of them might be vaccinated. Total information at present, uh, it's not well documented in the COVAX system where we document immunization status. Um, so it's anecdotal by survey. Um, uh, if you recall, we've done surveys, uh, well, the uh, professional associations have done surveys. So physicians are well over 90% have adopted first and second doses already. I'm sure that number is uh, going higher and higher by the week. Um, I've heard anecdotal information of 80% on average for workers uh, in acute care facilities but it can be low as 70 or 60, depending on what workforce you're surveying. Uh, so what we need from a patient perspective is that um, uh, any point of exposure in a healthcare sector uh, can put you at risk. Uh, and so we need all workers in those environments to rise up and have the highest immunization rates possible. As you recall, over the first, second and third waves, we did have outbreaks in the acute care sector. We did have transmission and we frankly, sadly, have had deaths. Um, these are avoidable. They're preventable. I, I think the CEOs, the workers in hospitals want the safest work environment and they want the safest environment for their patients, uh, many of whom are immunosuppressed. They're getting their cancer therapies. They are getting their cancer surgeries. Um, we can do better. We can have higher immunization rates. I hope the workers embrace this immunization policy as a nudge. Um, but if they don't get immunized, uh, we need also to have a testing strategy to best protect those patients. I'm happy to say that many acute care facilities have already adopted policies and are willing to go even further. Um, and I fully support uh, the best protection uh, of patients across Ontario in the acute care sector through uh, immunization policies. Next question. Your next question comes from Chris Herhalt with CP24. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Moore. About COVAX, um, who exactly has access to 
COVAX to determine someone's vaccination status. And will that be accessed only in settings deemed to have an outbreak? Uh, because what you said earlier about, sorry, what you said earlier about, um, about vaccination status and self-isolation rules in school settings, it, it strictly differentiates those who are vaccinated versus those who are not. Yeah, so the information custodian for COVAX uh, is the province, so it would be under, um, most likely under the office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Um, the health units have access to COVAX in the event of an outbreak uh, and uh, can use it as a tool to ascertain the immunization status of individuals for whom they are actively investigating an outbreak. Follow-up? Yeah, just about the rapid antigen. Even at the lowest known bulk prices of the kits that the federal government has procured for us, um, this will eventually amount to hundreds of thousands of dollars per week. So why is the government, why, why are we committing to picking up the tab indefinitely when other jurisdictions, as a, as a form of sort of a stick to promote vaccination, have said, okay, if you're going to embark on this path, eventually you will be paying for those tests yourself. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not clear on the question of who are you suggesting will be paying for it? Well, right now, the federal government is, but eventually the supply of rapid antigen they've acquired will run out. And, uh, or what are we committing ourselves to here? That's certainly a possibility, um, but uh, I don't think it's a probability. Uh, the, the antigen supply chain uh, uh, for the testing capacity has been quite robust and improved significantly over the last year and a half. Um, uh, if it becomes cost prohibitive, we'll absolutely review um, the, the, the costs and the program. Um, this is our initial rollout of immunization policy. Um, uh, it's our hope and goal that the number of tests actually decreases over time uh, as more individuals uh, realize the benefit of a safe and effective vaccine uh, as the means of reducing the risk in our communities and preventing preventing transmission. We need the highest rate of immunization in our communities to best protect our children, our schools, uh, as well as those that are vulnerable. Um, so uh, absolutely we'll assess costs, we'll monitor the utilization of the testing, um, uh, we'll monitor how effective it is as a strategy, uh, and we will review our policies on an ongoing basis um, to ensure it's meeting its aim. Next question. Your next question comes from Holly McKenzie Suter with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, wondering about the school policy. If the you know proof of vaccination or testing requirement in um, schools would apply to eligible students older than 12, or if the um, the province is considering that at all right now. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, I think it's prudent and reasonable to start looking at an immunization strategy um, for students. Uh, if we're applying it for the workforce, uh, we want all of them to be safe uh, in the school environment. Uh, so we're in active discussion with the um, Ministry of Education on having an immunization policy. Uh, typically, if we follow the immunization of student school pupils act which is in place in ontario uh, it would just mandate that students parents report uh, the immunization status of their children uh, and or take an educational module so we're viewing that i think it's prudent uh, to include that in the suite of policies uh, that uh, the immunization status of children be reported to their local public health agency so we know in advance um, the immunization status of students classes schools school boards uh, it helps us with uh, from a local public health agency for planning and responding uh, to um, out outbreaks in those settings uh, and uh, would speed up our ability to protect uh, the classroom the school the student uh, and the family uh, involved follow-up yeah thanks I'm wondering also about um, we're hearing from the government that they didn't go with mandatory shots for hospital workers because of the staffing shortage that's in that sector uh, so I'm wondering if staffing levels also contributed to the decision to not make the shots mandatory for schools and child care um, and if you think without those staffing challenges making shots mandatory would be more effective at controlling spread in those settings so the approach in Ontario has has always been, uh, and it started in the long-term care sector, to have uh, show us that you've been immunized uh, and or have an exemption uh, and or uh, 
uh, attend an educational event uh, and or have a testing strategy. So what we wanted across all uh, domains of government is have a consistent approach. Uh, so we learn from the long-term care sector. We're applying it in multiple other sectors now. Uh, that's been also consistent with the approach of the Immunization to School Pupils Act. Uh, report to us your immunization or have an exemption and or have an educational module uh, and or be exempt if there's an outbreak. So um, uh, we want consistent and persistent approaches in policy to our immunization strategy. Um, this is the Ontario way. It's been our way uh, as long as I've worked in public health uh, and uh, education has always been a strong component uh, of our policy. Um, um, clearly, uh, it's our, my hope uh, and my uh, wish that every Ontarian take advantage of these safe and effective vaccines. Um, this is a reminder that it is our best means of limiting the spread uh, as we go into the fall and winter of Delta. Um, uh, I hope this suite of tools that um, uh, Ontario has developed on immunization policy will be a call to arms, will increase our immunization rates across Ontario. I'm going to be following that a very very closely uh, over the next several weeks to see how effective these policies are at implementation, uh, as well as protecting our patients, our schools, our colleges and universities. Next question. Your next question comes from Lorenda Redikoff of CBC. Please go ahead. Hi there, Dr. Moore. Um, similarly to what Randy asked at the beginning there, you're the one responding to this and we don't have anyone from the government, no elected official. Why is that and how much of this is your recommendations and how much of this comes from Cabinet? Uh, so directives uh, in particular relating to acute care, chronic care sectors uh, would be coming from my office, um, the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Uh, I had discussions last week uh, with the Premier. Uh, we've briefed Cabinet uh, last night uh, and, and got uh, approval. Um, but this suite of tools uh, we've been developing since I started uh, in this office. Uh, and when we saw the rate of Delta increasing, uh, the transmission increasing, uh, uh, and um, uh, the slow and steady rise of cases across uh, Ontario. Um, I, I made the call to the Premier uh, and said we need directives in place uh, immediately to best protect us in the fall. Um, there was no disagreement. Um, uh, there was very good unanimous support from Cabinet uh, and, and hence the need, uh, you know, I don't think there's a need to have a Minister here today uh, given that these are directives from my office. Follow up. What more can you tell us about the people who are fully vaccinated, who are testing positive or ending up in hospital? Um, we see that real jump in hospitalizations today. Uh, for example, anything like such as age or are these people with health conditions? Is there anything that stands out? Yeah, so great question. We're doing ongoing analysis to understand um, what are called breakthrough infections and in those that are two dosed plus 14 days. Typically, it will be someone that's older, that's more vulnerable. Um, the reason that we made the recommendation for long-term care facilities to have the third dose is because we've uh, analyzed in frail elderly that their antibodies, those antibodies that protect us against infection, have tended to drop off in that population after four to five months after their last dose. Uh, and hence the, the recommendation that, that we've made uh, to uh, be able to provide a booster um, dose in, in that population. Um, that could be uh, some uh, of the the evidence that we're trying to build on, on why we're having breakthrough cases. But it's important to remember that no vaccine is 100% protective against this virus. This virus is uh, can spread rapidly. It's very aggressive. It's a formidable foe. Uh, and uh, in our evidence now, it's in the mid-80s that the vaccine will protect us uh, against the Delta strain. Uh, hence the reason we need to continue all of our best practices, infection prevention and control by masking in public settings, uh, on public transit, uh, by washing our hands, covering our cough, monitoring our symptoms and getting tested. Um, the vaccine's excellent. It's very good at protecting us, but no vaccine is 100%. Next question. Your next question comes from Rob Ferguson with the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Hi, Doctor. Since you've been developing uh, these policies, uh, as you just mentioned, since uh, you first came into the job, I'm, I'm wondering what else you have up your sleeve uh, for the fall if things get bad. Would you, would you move to a, a 
like a fully mandatory vaccination situation for these kinds of uh, uh, jobs and settings. Yeah, so a uh, great question. Um, I, my job is to look forward, to look, you know, 30, 60, 90 days forward. Uh, I w- want to let you know that we've been working all August with our hospital partners, with our public health partners. We've been doing tabletop exercises. We've been reviewing how best to react to this virus if there's outbreaks in certain settings. We've been practicing in our regions, uh, in our local public health agencies, and at a provincial level. So we have a suite of tools that we've developed, a suite of public health measures that we may have to put in play, uh, always trying to balance um, the measures and be proportionate uh, to the risk uh, and not to have any step backwards in terms of the um, uh, reopening of Ontario. Uh, uh, We are preparing aggressively for the fall. I am sorry to say I think it's going to be a difficult fall and winter uh, and hence the reason we're putting these policies in play to best protect our communities, protect those under uh, 12 years of age who can't get immunized uh, and to protect those settings. Um, uh, So I think you've heard from government our education plan. I'm very, very happy to have a a plan for our colleges and universities uh, that they must have an immunization policy in play across Ontario. Um, we're working actively with uh, private um, um, uh, um, private businesses uh, to encourage them to have um, immunization policies for their workforces as well. Um, we've now, uh, you know, the big tick boxes that I wanted to see in play were protection uh, of our acute care settings. Um, We need to protect those workers. We need to protect those patients. Um, After we've done long-term care, uh, I absolutely saw that home care um, was a a vulnerable setting where individuals are are caring for older people in their homes, in their houses, uh, and that setting need to be protected with immunization policies. Uh, uh, Daycare, we've seen numerous outbreaks in those settings, so very happy to have immunization policies there. We're now looking at other congregate and high-risk settings uh, and, and, and we'll continue along that path. Uh, but my immediate priorities were acute long-term care, acute care, uh, home care services, uh, ambulance services, uh, and um, colleges and universities. Uh, now that that's in place, um, I'm happy ha- the work that we've done with the Ministry of Education on immunization policies for their workers, uh, and we're reviewing, as I said, for students. Um, I hope you're seeing it's a suite of immunization policies that are absolutely directed to best protect Ontarians uh, and to increase our immunization rates in the face of what will be a difficult fall for all of us, but it would be the risk will be decreased the higher our immunization rates are. Follow up. Thanks for that, Doctor. Just would like to go into that a bit more. So you said you have a suite of public health measures you may have to put in play and you're preparing aggressively. So why not just uh, let us know what some of those things are now so that people can get ready for this and maybe it's, it would uh, encourage uh, more people to get vaccinated. Um, so they, they were scenario-based. Uh, some of the scenarios are just a rise in cases. Um, some of them are a, an emergent new strain. Um, so some of them are quite theoretical in terms of uh, how, how we'd have to respond. Um, I, I think I've told you most of the immunization policies that we want to, to have in play are in play as we speak uh, and will be um, uh, announced over the coming weeks with greater detail. Um, uh, so I, I think those uh, um, are ready. Um, the typical section orders that we'd have to put in play for limited uh, outbreaks in certain communities are very focused. Um, they would be targeted, um, such as what Waterloo had done on holding their community back on uh, reopening of Ontario. Uh, we, we used Waterloo's work as a, as a scenario to instruct us. Um, we also looked at uh, Porcupine Health Unit and their response. Uh, we looked at um, North Bay's response in congregate settings. Uh, and uh, we also looked at the activity that has been in Gray Bruce. Um, so so we, we are learning from all of these events. Um, we've created a list of tools that worked uh, in terms of public health measures, case and contact finding, inc- increasing in testing capacity, um, going to where the communities are that are most effective to ensure that we can increase their testing. So a lot of them have to do with outbreak management, uh, uh, testing management and strategies, uh, and improved case and contact management. Um, so 
So, so they're more for internal public health focus. Uh, the major section orders uh, that could be put in play would be very time limited. We want to minimize disruption of our economy going forward, minimize disruption of schools, universities and colleges. Um, uh, and so any orders would be targeted, focused and time limited. Last question. Your final question comes from Randall Dunlay with National Post. Please go ahead. Hi, Doctor. As you know, the uh, federal government has brought in a policy in areas under its control for what it calls mandatory vaccination. Uh, you haven't done that. I wonder why you think your approach is better than theirs. I don't necessarily uh, uh, think it's better. I really haven't seen any details. I've heard the federal announcement. Uh, I think they're going to have to have negotiations with their uh, their unions and further discussions. I think it's an announcement to have a plan, uh, and I do believe their plan would be released in 40 or more days. Um, our, our policies are in play now. They're immediate, um, and they follow the plan that Ontario has always followed of... Uh, show us that you've been vaccinated and or get a medical exemption and or get education and or test. That's a consistent strategy that we've embraced that's worked for us. Um, we will reflect on it if we're not achieving the immunization rates um, we need. Individual corporations, hospitals can do more uh, if uh, the, the, the risk to their uh, workforce uh, and their patients is higher uh, and the risk of Delta in their community is higher. There's certainly an opportunity um, for them to do more in terms of the immunization policy, but this is very consistent with Ontario's approach and I look very much forward to reviewing um, the, the, the policy direction that the government uh, has, a federal government has put in play and look at the details of that. Follow up and this is the last question. And uh, you mentioned uh, others doing more, you mentioned in your opening remarks as well. I, I wonder why you think that other entities should make vaccination mandatory if the government itself isn't going to do it. I'm sorry, so what, what entities in particular? No, I, I'm talking more theoretically. If the government isn't prepared at this point to make vaccination mandatory for anyone, why should other entities be doing it? Yeah, so w our policy is, uh, as I've outlined... If a, a corporation, uh, a hospital, uh, is finding that the policy isn't enough uh, to best protect their workers and uh, their patients and the community that they serve, uh, we're very much willing to work with them uh, on modifying the directive uh, and or um, giving them the latitude to be able to uh, um, make it mandatory, if necessary, based on a risk assessment. Um, Ours is the bare minimum um, that I would uh, expect uh, a, a partner uh, to implement uh, in their settings that we've outlined in the directives. Thanks, everyone.